And if somebody could just let me know if you can see my screen at this point. Yes. Okay, great. So the title of our talk tonight is Vaping, the Continuing Epidemic Among Our Youth. And it's really, um, there are some good things that I will share with you and, and then some, some not good things. And I will stop um, periodically to ask if there are any, any questions that we can address. So um, I started uh, getting interested in um, teen vaping probably around 2016, I guess about six years ago now. And um, I'm a member of the executive committee of the local chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and that's called chapter two, and it encompasses Nassau, Queens, um, and Brooklyn, and um, Suffolk County. And we started doing advocacy work around uh, vaping. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and just so you know, um, I, I'm, a, as it says, I'm vice chair of pediatrics at Cohen Children's Medical Center. And um, I still practice pediatrics in, of all places, Massapequa. Uh, Northwell has a pediatric practice in Massapequa um, on Hicksville Road, and that's where I see patients. So. Our objectives tonight, we are going to review the epidemiology of e-cigarette use amongst teens and young, among teens and young adults. We'll talk about what is an e-cigarette, you know, how it's put together, what, what it's made of. Um, the meat of the talk is going to be around these, the last two objectives. This, we're going to talk about why e-cigarettes are attractive to youth and um, the health risks associated with e-cigarette use. And then we're gonna wrap up with some uh, strategies and resources that are available, both to screen among, for e-cigarette use in our teens and uh, again, treatment sources. So the, some of the good news to start off, if we think about cigarette smoking in general, in the United States, really the peak um, for cigarette smoking was in the mid 1950s when, um, over 50% of US adults smoked cigarettes. And the first Surgeon General's warning about the, the uh, harmful effects of cigarette smoking and specifically the link of cigarette smoking to lung cancer, that came about in the early 1960s. And since the mid 60s, there has been a, a two thirds, 67% decline in smoking among adults in the US. Unfortunately, there are still about 34 million adults that smoke cigarettes on an almost daily basis. And this is really an important point. Nearly all adult smokers have been smoking since their teenage years. And we, we will talk a little bit later about why uh, having the tobacco age be 21 is, is really a very, very important um, strategy to, to limit teen smoking use. And, and we finally achieved that in the United States in uh, January of 2020, just over two years ago. Still, there are almost a half million deaths every year tied to cigarette smoking. Now that's not all lung cancer. Uh, there are the cardiovascular effects of, of cigarette smoking. There are multiple other cancers, uh, cancers of the, the for lack of a better word, windpipe, uh, oral cancers, mouth, oral mouth cancers, lip cancers, et cetera. Um, and there's also a significant um, disease burden from secondhand smoke that, that occurs. And on average, life expectancy, if you're a smoker, it's 10 years less than if you don't smoke. And there are over 1,300 deaths a day to smoking. So when I speak to, to groups, whether it's a parent group, whether it's students in a high school, and even if it's um, you know, pediatricians, I, I like this picture because it basically shows what your heart and what your lungs look like if you don't smoke and if you do smoke. And you can, it, it, you know, it's very, very obvious, right? The, the difference between a healthy set of lungs you see on the lower left of your screen and right next to it, a uh, set of lungs from somebody who smoked for a long time and the same thing with the heart. Um, so this picture, this slide really kind of frames our, uh, our discussion. And I like it because 
it takes us really over the last decade, you know, from 2011 to 2019, as you can see. And if we go all the way to the left and look at the 2011 um, cigarette smoking, traditional, what we call combustible cigarettes, was the most common form of tobacco used by youths in the United States. And if you follow that gray line all the way down to the right side of the screen, you can see in 2019, it was just over 5%. But look at the red line, go back to 2011 and look at that red line, which is e-cigarette use and focus on 2017 and what happened after 2017. And that's because of really one brand and one brand only, and that's Juul, because Juul hit the market um, in 20, between 2015 and 2016, and their sales just took off and cigarette use by t i mean excuse me e-cigarette use specifically jewel just exploded so the big picture is we are at the highest rate of teen tobacco use regard you know when we take all the different products put together um in over 20 years this is um these are results from a study from um that was published in the new england journal of medicine and looked at use e-cigarette use amongst uh, high school students from 2017 to 2019. And this was really the peak. So I have circled prevalence in 2019, 35.1%. And that was the question was among 12th grade students in the survey over the past 12 months, over the past year, how much how many of you vaped and it was 35 percent now this this was not daily vaping but this was had at least vaped and so over a third of 12th graders had vaped and this study which was in the journal of the american medical association a pediatric um, edition shows trends in use and perceptions of nicotine vaping amongst youth for a little greater time period 2017 to 2020 and I want to draw your attention to the um, figure on the right, which is prevalence of Juul use. So we're talking about specifically Juul, no, no other brands among 10th grade and 12th grade students by year of reporting. And so this is this is good, right? If you, you see the the um, the bar on the left to the of the arrow that was used in past 12 months in 2017, again, just under 30%. And in 2020, it was down to 20.9%. Um, the graph on the left shows uh, the left shows prevalence of nicotine vaping. That's all you know types of products, and you can see the trends on the on the far right of that graph. That's lifetime use. So still, there was an increase from 2019 to 2020 in lifetime vaping again among 10th and 12th graders. Now, this is very recent data. This is from um, the uh, CDC puts out the morbidity and mortality weekly report. And this is tobacco product use among, um, this is among high school students comparing 2019 to 2020. And if you follow over from the left, one, two, three, the fourth set of bars, that's e-cigarettes. And you can see the decline among high school students um, from 2019 to 2020, and therefore going back to the far left side of the screen, we had a nice drop because of any tobacco use. Um, so that's, you know, that's overall. And this is for um, our middle school students, a really big drop from 2019 to 2020 in e-cigarettes and overall any tobacco product use. Um, this is more data from that report. And again, the US government puts out, uh, it's, it's called the National Youth Tobacco Survey that is administered um, yearly now. It used to be biannually, now it's yearly. And so we see among high school students, current use of e-cigarettes, over just over 11% of high school students admitted to current use and just under 3% of middle school students admitted to um, 
current use of e-cigarettes. And this is, again, this was the uh, 2021 survey. So this is very, very, very recent data. Okay, um, now this drills down a little deeper into that data. And when we look at frequency of e-cigarette use, 20 to 30 days of, um, per month. So if you do you, how, how frequently do you vape? And so of, so we take all our high school students that 11.3% that admitted to vaping, 43% of them are vaping 20 to 30 days per month. So that's almost every day, right? And a, a very important number is the middle school students admitted to vaping, 17.2% of them admitted to vaping 20 to 30 days a month as well. The other two points that I wanna make on this slide is what were they vaping? And what, what teens vape today in 2021, 22 is very, very different than what they were vaping in 2017, 2018, and 2019. These days, the majority of teens are vaping what are known as disposables. Juul is a pre-filled pod. Um, and the use of Juul has dropped significantly and we'll talk about why and why disposables are now so popular. And the last point I wanna make on this slide, I know it's a lot of details, it's why we put the red boxes around it. What are they vaping? They're vaping flavors. Eight, almost 86% of high school students said they vaped a flavored e-cigarette. So that's not a tobacco flavor. That could be a fruit flavor. That could be um, creme brulee. That could be, you know, watermelon. There's, there's, there's thousands of flavors, literally. And the numbers are the same for the middle school students. I want to drill down a little bit. How are we doing in New York State? So this graph shows tobacco product use among high school students in New York State. So New York State also administers a youth tobacco survey. And this gives us a, this, this graph gives us a 20 year snapshot. And any tobacco product is the, the top line in blue. And if you follow that across, we had, a, it reached its nadir in 2014. And then because of the rise of these cigarettes, it went up and then you can um, look at the yellow bar because the, the New York State survey didn't start tracking e-cigarette use until 2014. And in New York State, it reached a peak in 2018 and we've had uh, a bit of a decline since then. Um, Massapequa Takes Action Coalition conducts their own survey amongst uh, teens and young adults in the Massapequa's community, and they were kind enough to share this data with me. Um, so the, I guess, uh, maroon bars, if I'm getting my colors correct, or, or uh, dark red bars are vape use, and the blue bars are cigarette use. And we have on the left side of the screen, data from 2018, and on the right side of the screen, data from 2021, and the number 789, uh, refer to grade in school. So in 2018, uh, um, amongst uh, the population surveyed in Massapequa, 39% of 12th graders admitted to vaping. And that was down to 23% in 2021. Um, unfortunately, the use of cigarettes went from 5% among 12th graders in 2018 to, as you can see, 15%. And, and that's really alarming. So I'm gonna stop there. I, I shared a lot of data, but I, I really wanted to give you a sense of where we are as a country uh, amongst e-cigarette use amongst teens, as well as where we're at in the state and in our local community. So uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. You know, just for us to make a point with regards to the vaping and the decrease in the vaping, um, the district, the school district had a zero tolerance policy that was really uh, implemented as well as uh, provided in assemblies to all of the students from grades uh, 
I guess it's grade six through 12. Uh, so when the vaping was, you know, at its, at its peak, um, they, they really took action and, and developed that policy. The coalition uh, provided a, a series of educational forums and um, also did a lot of, uh, you know, social marketing. Uh, whether it was across Facebook or in the local papers. Uh, so there was quite a community effort. Um, you know, we, we, we don't know why. I, I mean, we can make assumptions why it's traditional cigarette use went up, but we also had COVID during this time. Uh, but I think one of the things that people think of e-cigarettes as a cessation device, and, and it, you know, from what we can see from the slides, it's not. Correct. Exactly. Absolutely. It's an, ex it's an excellent point. And, and we'll show some um, data later on about um, teens who start out, you know, vaping, become addicted to nicotine and wind up on traditional cigarettes. And that's exactly what you know, the tobacco companies want to happen. Um, so what is an e-cigarette? So e-cigarettes were, were really um, invented, created in 2003. In China, they were created, created by a Chinese pharmacist who was a, a lifelong cigarette smoker. And what he was, what he set out to do was to try to create a product that was quote unquote safer to use than a traditional cigarette. Because at the end of the day, you're addicted to nicotine. And um, when you're addicted to nicotine, you need to get your nicotine unless you're looking to, you know, quit, right? So cigarettes, everyone knows are harmful. So is there, a, is there another way to uh, deliver nicotine? And that's where uh, e-cigarettes or what are known as ENDS, electronic nicotine delivery system. So, I mean, we think about it, you can chew gum and get nicotine. You can put a patch on and get nicotine. You could smoke a Marlboro, you can get nicotine. You could use an e-cigarette. Um, and as it says, we, they were originally created to help smokers quit. Um, and, you know, the original Juul campaign was make the switch, you know, stop smoking combustible cigarettes, switch over to e-cigarettes. And they they were marketed as a safer option. So e-cigarettes come in many shapes and sizes, so to say. There are disposable e-cigarettes, there are rechargeable e-cigarettes, and that's the Juul or Pod system. And then there are, are mods, and mods are kind of, um, there, there are tank devices that are refillable. Um, you go to a vape shop, you buy e-cigarette e liquid or juice, as they call it, and then you put it into the tank and you vape. Um, and you know, initially, because of the, the popularity of the rechargeables, uh, our, our teens were walking around in school with these devices. And you know, if you didn't know better, you thought it was a USB device. Because um, unlike you know, traditional cigarettes, the, the vape itself, the, it, it's, you know, there's no odor to it. And so we all heard, heard the stories about you know, uh, our, our teens running into the, the bathroom every, every, in between every period and, and taking hits off of their, uh, their jewels. So um, again, this is, I'm just gonna skip over this in the interest of time, but again, uh, rechargeable devices and, and, or cartridge devices, the device stays, the cartridge gets used up, you put a new cartridge into them and the cartridges contain nicotine and the flavorings. Um, in terms of kind of the anatomy or the guts of a cigarette, um, it doesn't matter what type we're talking about. There's a battery, there is an atomizer. So that's typically a heating coil. So um, you basically press a little button, which causes the battery to send a charge to a heating coil which then heats the liquid into a vape, into you know a, a, va a vapor, and that's what you what you breathe in. Um, and the cartridge contains, as you see there, the nicotine flavoring and other chemicals. So, regardless, again, whether it's a rechargeable device, a tank device, that's the anatomy. You need a power source, you need a heating coil, and you need liquid that gets heated into vapor. So 
let's talk about how e-cigarettes came to be so attractive to our, our teens and young adults and our youth. And it is, it's not a new story. And you have to remind yourself or remember that tobacco companies are in business for one thing and one thing only, and that's to make money, right? And so, you know, I showed in the beginning the decrease in cigarette use among U.S. adults going back to the mid-1960s. And so if you are, you know, a tobacco company and you see your market share decreasing year after year after year as less adults are smoking, that's not good for your business model. So we need a product that is going to be attractive to youth, that is going to essentially hook the next generation of nicotine users for their, for their life. I mean, we all, I think, depending on the age of uh, people on our on our call tonight um, back in the mid 1980s or so and uh, early 90s camel cigarettes had a very popular advertising campaign called Joe Camel and it was like a very uh, cartoonish animated uh, camel that was created specifically to be attractive to to young adults um, and Joe Camel actually was banned um, at, at, as an ad campaign. And, you know, and we have come a long way in that. I mean, we, we, we can remember that cigarettes used to be advertised on television. Cigarette ad, cigarettes were uh, advertising were prevalent on billboards. You'd go to a, a baseball game or a basketball game and you'd see bill, you know, billboards and advertising for cigarettes. And they were, you know, in newspapers and magazines. And first to go was, was, was TVs, TV ads. Next to go were um, ads in newspapers, and then finally, you know, billboards, ads, billboards. So you really don't see any advertising today uh, for traditional cigarettes, very little. So again, I get it's, it's, there's nothing new here. Um, on the left side of that picture is uh, a gentleman with an e-cigarette in his hand, and he's supposed to be very, you know, machismo and uh, rugged, and then the, the split screen on the right is the Marlboro Man, an iconic figure in uh, cigarette advertising history. Um, so it's the same story pushed by Big, big Tobacco. Um, here are some very old cigarette ads on the left, looking at Lucky Strike and Chesterfield and Santa, Santa Claus, you know, pitching cigarettes. Um, but on the right, we have vaping ads using Santa. I don't always vape, but when I do, I choose Vapor Shark. And on the bottom, there's Santa holding his uh, vape tank device. The toys are delivered. The reindeer put away. It's time for my vacation. I'll vape till New Year's Day. So they're using, as said, you know, Santa Claus to to sell vapes. Um, on the left, a, a very old ad, probably from the 1930s or 40s. Make your dad's light up, eyes light up as he lights up his favorite smoke for Father's Day. So, you know, give your dad a carton of cigarettes um, for Father's Day. But on the right, happy Father's Day, say 15% on all cartridges. And then the bottom one, there's a, you know, preschool age child there, four or five year old child, happy Father's Day weekend. Give your father the perfect gift, an electronic cigarette starter kit. And it's, it's really just mind blowing. So it's the same players, it's big tobacco with just new products. Now, this slide I like because it shows cigarettes, e e excuse me, e-cigarette sales going back to 2013 through 2018. So this date, date is a few years old, but it really tells a story. The, um, the dotted line that ends in that blue box on the right is Juul Labs. So Juul came into being as an entity in uh, the middle of 2015 and really exploded and became to, had the lion's share of the e-cigarette industry uh, by 2018. And the thing to know is that your traditional tobacco companies are the ones backing e-cigarette companies. They are the majority uh, owners and shareholders. Altria 
right there. That's uh, the, the, I guess, corporate name for Philip Morris. And uh, Altria actually had, has a uh, it's 36, 37%, 7% ownership stake in uh, Juul. So this is bait and switch, right? And, you know, I'm going to show you some, some more pictures, but it's like, who, as the, as the slide says, who do you think tobacco companies are trying to catch? They're going after our youth with advertising to get the next generation uh, of, of, of youth and young adults addicted to nicotine. And then they have a, a, a customer for life. Because when, they, when you survey lifelong smokers, over 90% almost 91% admit, you know, said that they started smoking before the age of 18. So you target them young, you get them addicted, you have a lifelong customer. Now, th this, these are some of the, the packaging that's going on um, to, to sell e-cigarette liquid. Look on the left, that is, that looks like a juice box. You take a quick look, oh, that's a, that's a juice box, it's apple juice box, but that's nicotine. It, that is e-cigarette liquid packaged, and then there's a squirt bottle next to it, packaged to look like, you know, apple juice. And it has three mil, as you can see, it has three milligrams of nicotine in in that um, 180 um, milliliters, which is which is six ounces. So three milligrams of nicotine in six ounces of liquid. And if you look on the right, those are bottles again of e-cigarette candy flavored liquid that are made to look like the twirly pops that you, you, you see there. Um, here's more pictures, vapor, vape liquid made to look like uh, packaged in the same kind of cups that uh, you would buy a slushie in. And again, kids, when they start vaping, they're not vaping tobacco flavored products. They're vaping a candy flavored product, a fruit flavored uh, of nicotine liquid. So 81% of kids who ever tried e-cigarettes were using a flavored product. And you know, this is, this is from um, Stanford University. They have an amazing uh, tobacco research uh, center at Stanford, the, the um, web address is at the bottom of the slide, but they have compiled over 15,000 different flavors and they have them categorized here. So up at the top left, uh, 75, they have 75 different images for chocolate flavored liquid. If you click on, you know, you click on the, on that link, if you're on their website, candy, almost 260 images soda pop 138 you know so it the the uh, variety and assortment are tremendous and, and this is data that was published in the journal of the american medical association in 2019 looking at eighth graders 10th graders and 12th graders and what were they vaping so you can see mint flavor most popular um mango flavor very very popular but look up at the top classic tobacco flavor they're not vaping that Virginia tobacco, which is towards the bottom on the left column, uh, they're not vaping that. They are vaping flavors, fruit, mango, mint flavor. And then this is from more data from the 2020 National Youth Tobacco uh, Survey. And this looks at what were they vaping based on the type of device they were using, was, whether it was a pre-filled pot, a disposable, a tank, a mod system or uh, don't know, but in each and every case, fruit flavor was number one, followed by mint and then candy. So I'll stop there. I, I hope I've been able to, to make the case uh, to you about how uh, teens were, were, were targeted by big tobacco companies through their marketing um, and through the use of flavors to get them addicted to using uh, e-cigarettes and becoming addicted to nicotine. Any questions or comments at this point? No questions in the chat box. Okay, thank you. So I, I think it, 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 it bears mentioning that, you know, we, we don't uh, come down with lung cancer uh, or any of the other harmful effects 
of vaping or cigarette smoking because of nicotine with, with kind of the exception that nicotine is a stimulant and will, uh, it can cause an increase in, in blood pressure because it's, uh, it, it is what's known as a vasoconstrictor, but nicotine in and of itself is not a carcinogen. Now, nicotine is found, na it is found naturally in tobacco. So it's not like a tobacco uh, company, you know, cigarette manufacturer has to add nicotine to tobacco. I mean, there's ways to increase uh, the, the nicotine levels in, in cigarettes, but nicotine is naturally found in tobacco. And nicotine is a stimulant. It is highly addictive, which is why people have such a hard time quitting smoking. And it, it, it's important to note, it changes brain chemistry. And this is really, really important when we're talking about our teens and young adults, because your brain, the, the brain of, an, of a teenager is not fully developed, and we'll get into this in a little bit, until really their early 1920s, uh, 19, not, excuse me, not 1920s, until they're in their early 20s. Um, and you get addicted very, you can get addicted very quickly. Tolerance occurs in a short period of time. And, and, and here's what I was talking about. Teens are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of nicotine on, on their central nervous system because the parts of the brain that are most responsible for things like decision-making, impulse control, pleasure-seeking, and susceptibility to peer pressure are not fully developed in adolescence. That, those are the parts of the brain that are not developed until their early 20s. And so the teen brain is, is much more sensitive to the effects of nicotine than an adult brain. So you get a much higher spike and delivering drugs this way uh, through use of e-cigarettes results in quicker addiction. And so, you know, let's say you've been vaping and you say, you know, I need to stop. This is, this is enough. It's not good for me. This is what you're dealing with in turn, you know, if you wanted to go cold turkey and you really have a nicotine addiction, there are both physical effects and psychological effects that you are going to have to overcome if you're going to be successful. Now, I, 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 Really, this slide is 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 really critical. This um, is from a report from the the, the Surgeon General put out uh, about six years ago: e-cigarette use among youth and young adults. And again, so this is early on. This is really before we were deep into the epidemic. Um, but this this fact of sixty three percent of Juul users did not know that Juuls always had nicotine in them. Meaning, you know, you ask a teen and they're saying, no, it just, you know, it, I, I like the way it tastes. I, I, I take a hit and I get this vapor that tastes like strawberries or tastes like cotton candy or, or whatever. And they don't realize that there's nicotine in that vapor. And in many cases, these cigarettes deliver higher levels of nicotine than traditional cigarettes. So this is what happens. You're addicted. You're handcuffed. All right, so you vape and do you stick with vaping? You might, but there's lots and lots of lots of evidence. And I'm just, I'm just showing you um, two studies and I think I skipped over a slide I did. Yeah, so the first real large study that um, showed that if you vaped, you were more likely to go on and use traditional cigarettes was published about four years ago in the journal Pediatrics. And the, the title of the article was Teens Who Use These Cigarettes May Be More Likely to Smoke Cigarettes Later On. And this was a survey that was done in Connecticut in three public high schools over a three year period, they ran, they did the survey three different times, three different years in 2013, 14, and 15, looked at over 800 students. And so a, a teen who smoked in, who smoked an e-cigarette during one month were up to seven times more likely to smoke traditional tobacco cigarettes, combustible cigarettes in the future. So you start out vaping, 
and you, you know, you're seven times more likely to wind up smoking traditional cigarettes. And, you know, maybe that's what some of that massive people data showed for that increase in uh, cigarette use when they, when they compare 2018 to, to 2020. The other study that I wanted to uh, share with you was um, published in JAMA Pediatrics, and it was teen e-cigarette use, again, converting to smokers. So if you ever smoked an e-cigarette, that was strongly associated with subsequent initiation of traditional cigarette use. And the higher nicotine e-cigarette users, so you know, there's different levels of nicotine depending on the product, uh, the e-cigarette product, higher nicotine users were more likely to progress to traditional cigarettes. And this is really an alarming story because this is exactly what tobacco companies want. So if, if we recall pre-pandemic, um, around the summer of 2019, either you started reading and hearing in the media uh, about reports of people going to the hospital because of uh, difficulty breathing and uh, coughing related to e-cigarette use. And the term was called e volley or e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury. And, and this, is, this was not like a pneumonia. Um, this was not an infection. This was lung damage due to vaping. And the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine put out a report and this report is from 2018. And among their conclusions is, there is conclusive evidence that in addition to nicotine, most e-cigarette products contain and emit numerous potentially toxic substances. So not just vaping nicotine, you are putting into your body, into your lungs, toxic substances. And these substances include volatile organic compounds, ultrafine particles. So that means really mic microscopic particles. You know, think of a grain of sand and then think 10,000 times smaller, but those things get deposited into your lungs. There are also cancer causing chemicals in e-cigarette liquid. And, and we're going to talk about that because it's, it's, um, it's, it's really a big loophole that, that we have to address. And remember, there's a heating coil, right? That battery heats up, uh, sends a spark and heats up this heating coil. And so those heating coils um, contain heavy metals such as nickel, tin, and lead. So you're burning a metal and then you're breathing in uh, you know, the byproduct of, of, of burning that metal. And then there's all the flavorings and the chemicals that are in the flavorings. Um, Okay, so um, many studies have suggested that the vapor in and of itself can irritate air, uh, airway cells um, and, and you're, you're coating, you know, think about it this way. So you have a liquid um, and you're heating it up into a vapor, but then when it gets into your body, that vapor cools down and that liquid then it, 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 it's basically sticky. It's not just water. Uh, and we'll talk about the chemical that makes it sticky. And that impairs cells' ability to fight infection and can cause damage in lungs, lung tissue. And studies have shown that if you use e-cigarettes, you're at a higher risk for developing chronic lung diseases such as asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, and COPD. So from that same um, report from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, in 2018, one of their other conclusions is there is moderate evidence for increased cough and wheeze in adolescents who use e-cigarettes and an association with e-cigarette use and an increase in asthma exacerbations. And, you know, you may have heard, you know, stories about uh, athletes who were, you know, star soccer players or track, high school track uh, athletes who started vaping and then, you know, couldn't run as, 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 as long and as hard or on the soccer field had to, had to stop because they were out of breath because of what was 
put into their lungs by vaping. So we really reached kind of a peak uh, in, the, in the vaping crisis with admissions to the hospital and um, visits to the emergency room in, in the late summer to early, uh, early fall of 2019. And as the CDC analyzed um, um, fluid from people's lungs, because when, if, you, if you're that sick that you're intubated, you can put a tube down into the lungs and extract fluid. Um, the culprit seemed to be a compound called vitamin E acetate. Now this is a very common compound and it's used in lots of cosmetic products. It's used in, in, in uh, you know, skin lotions, um, but if you inhale it, it's not good. So it's safe to put on your skin, but it doesn't belong in your lungs. And so this graph shows visit, this was data from the New England that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it, it, and it shows uh, visits to the emergency room related to e-cigarette use. And you can see that peak on September 8th, but that age group, that was the young adult age group, that was the 10 to 19 year olds. And then you can also see the, the peak because the peaks were all at the same time in the 20 to 29 year olds and the 30 to 39 year olds. Um, we used to look at this data frequently throughout the uh, summer and fall of um, 2019. And I keep this uh, slide in the presentation just as a reminder that the CDC actually stopped reporting on E-Valley um, admissions to the hospital, visits to the ER, and deaths associated with E-Valley um, in February of 2020. And really what happened three weeks later, the pandemic. So, you know, priorities changed and shifted. But at the time, there were 68 E-Valley deaths in uh, the United States and over 2,800 uh, cases of vaping associated um, lung illnesses. So I want to I want to stop there. You know, we've talked a little bit about what nicotine is. We talked about the harmful effects of nicotine and what it does to not not nicotine. I'm sorry. What um, e-cigarette use does to the lungs of people who vape. And so I just want to see if there are any any questions or comments at this point. There's no questions in the chat room, but. Um... I recently spoke with somebody who said that their um, family member had mouth cancer and they were blaming it on e-cigarettes or vaping. And I was curious if that is, you know, is, is that being looked at also in terms of the ingestion through the mouth uh, with the chemicals? Have you ever heard of that? I, I have not seen data um, reporting incidents of oral or mouth cancer related to e-cigarette use. I'm happy to, you know, to go search for, you know, to take a look at that, but, um, you know, in, in, in my readings uh, of the literature regarding e-cigarette use, I have not seen mouth or oral cancers associated with that, but I, I will look about that. So, I have a question as well, if I can. Um, in terms of just the nicotine alone, uh, regardless of any other impact in the lungs from other uh, from carcinogens, is there some uh, effect of um, from from uh, like a, a dopamine then uh, response that? becomes now um, solidified in the brain where now this person's more susceptible to dopamine seeking behaviors, compulsive behaviors, uh, whether it be, you know, any, anything that's addicting that now like that's imprinted in the brain and you're more susceptible. No, you're absolutely right. You, 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 you know, hit, hit the nail on the head, bullseye. The, the teen brain is more susceptible because uh, of, like I said earlier, the, of the developing brain. And so that dopam dopaminergic response is heightened and yes, leads to, you know, the, you know, pleasure seeking behaviors. And so, 
your brain becomes um, attuned or accustomed to nicotine, and then it's more likely to seek out other pleasure-seeking activities, and whether that's chemical, other chemicals, uh, whether that's alcohol, or whether that's you know risky behaviors, it it, it all gives the same that dopamine rush. So that it's an excellent point, and thank you for making that. One other question then related to that, with the rush, does that also likely contribute to a dip that, you know, the, in terms of the withdrawal effect? Oh, it does. I mean, think about like your, your, your classic uh, lifelong smoker. You ask any lifelong smoker, what's their best cigarette of the day? It's their first cigarette in the morning after waking up because they've had that dip overnight while they were asleep and they need that hit of nicotine to get that surge again. Mm. Exactly. I mean, or, or e even now, like you're right, you can't smoke on an airplane, right? So, and you can't smoke in an airport. So what's the first thing you do when you see people waiting at the curb outside the terminal for, uh, you know, their car, their taxi, their Uber, whatever, they all light up as soon as they get outside. And, and, and that's why. Um, so I want to shift to, to talking a little bit about marijuana or THC. So when I speak to uh, parents, most parents are not familiar with this term danking, but if I speak to a group of high school students, they all know what danking is. So danking is kind of the slang um, for the use of THC, which is the psychoactive compound in marijuana. Um, and Dank Vapes is a one popular brand, but Dank Vapes doesn't originate from any one company. Um, and, and there's, you know, very, very, very little regulation or oversight over the um, production or manufacture of um, THC containing liquids. You have some in states where recreational marijuana use is legal. And that's, as we know, coming to, to New York state. Um, and, you know, so you don't, you know, you don't really know what you're putting into your lungs when you're vaping THC liquids. And um, many, but not all of the cases of E Valley were associated with um, vaping of THC liquids. Again, many, but not all. Um, so while my, my last bullet point on this slide, while vape companies are required to submit ingredient lists to the, to the FDA. So vape, when I say vape companies, um, I'm talking about uh, nicotine vaping. Dank vapes are really the wild west. There's, there's no oversight. Um, now let's, so there's, there's evidence, there's data that show, and this, this uh, kind of the timing is right because we just kind of talked about this, the use of uh, your, 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 your brain is primed by using e-cigarettes and, and the nicotine effects um, to seek out other um, substances. So teens using e-cigarettes are at higher risk to use marijuana. This is a study published in Pediatrics in 2018, and um, it has two age cohorts, age 12 to 14 and age 15 to 17. Um, and initially in the first wave, they were never using marijuana, um, but in the first wave, it was did you, you did you use e-cigarettes? Yes or no? And among the e-cigarette users in wave two, they were 2.7 times more likely to use marijuana in the younger age cohort, and 1.6 times more likely in the older age cohort. And here's a second study: um, teens using e-cigarettes again, higher risk to use marijuana, and um, you see the red box, e-cigarette and hookah use at age 14. And so hookah is another way to, to, you know, get nicotine into your, into your body. E-cigarette and hookah use at age 14 was associated with a 3.6 to fourfold increase in the odds of initiating and currently using marijuana two years later. And this data, again, is from uh, the Massapequa Takes Action Coalition survey of youth in 
massive mass of peak was. And again, comparing 2018 to 2021, and we can see mar marijuana use trending upward, uh, especially among the 12th graders, the, the uh, you know, the, the 8th, 9th, uh, 10th, and 11th are pretty this pretty much the same from 2018 to 2021 slight increase in the 11th graders but a significant increase among the among the 12th graders and then um this may be even more alarming the perception that um you know using marijuana is um that you know it's harmful that that perception is decreasing so, and as you get older that you see that number going down and that's consistent um, in, in both, uh, both surveys 2018 to 2019. So, you know, it's basically uh, the, the 12th grader saying, what's the big deal? It's just marijuana. Well, it's not. Um, again, same type of marketing um, tactics approaches when we're talking about uh, vape products that contain THC again, the psychoactive compound in marijuana. And you can see the, the assortment of, of uh, flavors, sunset sherbet, uh, mojito, orange daiquiri, et cetera. And the, this, is, this is crazy. I mean, and this is, you know, you can find this in, and we'll probably see this in New York, right? But you go to states where recreational marijuana use is legal and you go into the shops and these products, right? Looks like a bag of Cheetos, looks like a, a, a package of Oreos, looks like Fruity Pebbles, but no, these are all THC cannabis products deceptively designed to look like standard snacks. So who are they targeting, right? I mean, you and I don't, don't eat sour patches, right? Um, you and I, we may eat chips or something, but they're marketing this towards, towards teens. Um, I want to just stop and talk a little bit about um, the tobacco purchase age. So up until January of 2020, it was up to the states to set, and, and not even the states, local municipalities to set the tobacco purchase age. And so what's the big deal if it's 18 or 21? Well, as I said earlier, over 90% of lifelong smokers admitted to starting smoking prior to the age of 18. And so the, the, the evidence shows if you can increase the tobacco purchase age to 21, then you're going to have a significant impact on people starting smoking. Um, and, and you think about it this way, if you are 16 or 17 years old and you're thinking of trying cigarettes, you probably know somebody who's 18 who could buy them for you. But if you're 16 and 17 years old and, and the tobacco purchase age is 21, it's a lot less likely that you know somebody who's 21 that's in your same social circle who could go buy cigarettes for you, right? Because you're in high school, you're a 10, let's say you're a 10th grader, uh, how many 21 year olds do you know? Not as many, you know, maybe you have a sibling, but you're probably not going to ask your sibling unless they're already smoking. Cause when, when you're 21, you're in college, we're already out of college. So New York became tobacco 21 in 2019, but in November, literally two months before the whole country went to, uh, to 2020, um, to tobacco 21. Um, in Nassau County, it's an interest, it's a interesting story and it, it just bears a minute to mention. In the Nassau County legislature, for a period of 10 years, every year a bill was introduced to raise the purchase price to 21. Suffolk County raised the age to 21 in 2016. New York City did it in 2014. The whole the state of New Jersey did it, uh, the whole state in, in 2015. But Nassau County, the legislature would not take up this bill. So the work we did in the local chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics is we said, okay, what makes up Nassau County from government, you know, from a government entity perspective? So we have the town of North Hempstead, we have the town of Hempstead, we have the town of Oyster Bay, which is where Massapequa is, then we have the city of Glen Cove and the city of Long Beach. So if the county won't do this, 
if we go to each of the local governments and get them to, to raise the age to 21, then we have the whole county. And we were successful in the town of North Hempstead first, in the town of Hempstead, in the city of Long Beach. And then lo and behold, because of the, the vaping epidemic, in the spring of uh, 2019, the Nassau County Legislature finally took up the bill and passed it in May of 2019. And I remember uh, speaking in front of the legislature um, you know, to support the, the, the increase in the age to 21. And so Nassau County became 21 and then in May and then five months, uh, six months later, the whole state became 21. So that's kind of like the story of how we got to 21. Now, like I said, in, in, in January of 2020, the U.S. as a country became tobacco 21. And in 2020, in January, the Trump administration, the FDA under uh, Trump, prohibited fruit, mint, and dessert flavors in refillable cartridge-based e-cigarettes like Juul. Okay, so January 2020, Juul can no longer sell fruit flavors. They can't sell dessert flavors. They can't sell mint flavors. However, they were still allowed to continue to sell menthol flavors and tobacco flavors. And there was no prohibition of flavored li liquid nicotine. So when you go to your vape shop and you buy a quantity of liquid uh, you know, vape juice, that was not the, you know, so liquid nicotine, which would, you would pour into your tank device, that was not subject to that ban. Um, the, you know, so that was significant loopholes that were purposefully done because the, you know, the, the argument was, well, you're going to put small business owners out of business if you close vape shops. Um, and the allowing for menthol and tobacco flavors has to do with the fact that it, they, the government didn't want to be perceived as being biased um, against uh, eth ethnicities that prefer menthol flavors. So this was the FDA news release, finalizes enforcement policy on unauthorized flavored uh, cartridge-based e-cigarettes that are appealed to children, including fruit and mint. But again, nothing about menthol. So that, you know, in, in, a, in, in some ways that was a good thing, right? And they basically knocked Juul off their pedestal as being the, the leader, but what happened? And I showed one of this, you know, in the early slide that right now the predominant type of e-cigarette that is used by teens and youth are the disposables. So disposables were not subject to this FDA ban. So all the flavors may continue to be sold in devices that cannot be refilled and are designed to be disposed of after the flavored nicotine has run dry. These devices are cheap, they're accessible, and they are tailor-made to hook our teens and children. So, you know, I think everything I've showed you tonight says that vape, vaping may be on decline, but why are kids still vaping? And that's because of what we've talked about. Those candy and fruit flavors are still available in tank devices and in disposables. And the use of flavors is significantly correlated with increased use of dual and poly tobacco, so other type of product, tobacco products used. So just about, uh, I guess, I'm doing my math, five months ago now, the FDA for the first time authorized the um, marketing of an e-cigarette product. And, and when I say marketing, meaning this product may reduce your traditional tobacco use. And this is a product called Views, V-U-S-E, Solo. And right after the FDA authorized this product, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a statement um, this is the first e-cigarette product authorized by the FDA, and it is alarmingly the second most popular e-cigarette brand used by children. One pod contains over 28 milligrams of nicotine, which is almost as much as an entire pack of cigarettes. 
at 4.8%, its nicotine concentration levels are nearly identical to the Juul products that were responsible for the rise of youth tobacco uh, e-cigarette epidemic. So basically, Juul's kind of on the way out, and now there is this product. And this is a departure on the, on the FDA's part from policies that prohibit high nicotine products. Again, basically, the, again, the FDA was saying that this um, product is potentially something that could reduce the use of traditional cigarettes. But still, e-cigarettes are not approved for smoking cessation, and the FDA has not fully endorsed their safety or efficacy for uh, smoking cessation. So, you know, people should be advised to try other products um, like nicotine gums or nicotine patches. So, you know, what, what strategies work to reduce tobacco product use? And, you know, we've, we've talked about these and there are strategies at the national, state and local level that work. Increasing costs, right? Taxes, you know, we, we remember that cigarettes used to be extremely cheap and then the government started taxing them, taxing them, taxing them. And it, it, it correlated to a reduction in, in use. And those are known as, you know, sin taxes. Uh, prohibiting smoking in indoor areas or workplace and public places, raising the minimum age of sale of tobacco products, which we talked about, again, and then the advertising, radio, TV, commercials, posters, and other media messages aimed at kids. I mean, you, uh, you know, three years ago, uh, you'd go into convenience stores and you'd see, you'd be bombarded with, with, uh, with advertisements for Juul products, and now you don't, you don't see those anymore. And then obviously community uh, organizations such as uh, the Massapequa Takes Action Coalition and others that are out there talking to families and parents um, and groups about the dangers of, of tobacco use. Now, as pediatricians, we, we screen. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that we screen um, young adults and even preteens for e-cigarette use. And this is uh, the most popular screening tool is called the CRAFT. And um, question number four, use a vaping device containing nicotine and or flavors or any such tobacco products, right? Um, and this allows us then to, to, um, to counsel. Um, Northwell Health has a tobacco, uh, Northwell Health Center for Tobacco Control. And this is you know, this is open to anybody. Uh, you can you can Google this, and they have programs, both virtual and in person, um, for tobacco cessation. Whether it's traditional cigarettes or or e-cigarettes, and these these programs are also open to uh, you know to youth, to adolescents as as well. Um, there's an organization called the Truth Initiative. And the Truth Initiative has developed a very successful text messaging campaign specifically targeted towards teens, towards young adults, sending them messages. Um, and again, you know, young teens and young adults who enroll in the uh, Truth Initiative program, Text Jewel, uh, have a greater success rate of quitting vaping than uh, those that, you know, try on their own. And there are multiple apps. Here's one called This Is Quitting, uh, and that's from the Truth Initiative. And then there's a Quit Start app again. So obviously we know our teens are connected to their, their, their devices. And so you don't have to go it alone. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, for pediatricians has on their website how you would go about um, working with a teen using uh, gums and patches and the doses and, a and tapering schedules to wean them off of a nicotine addiction. So, um, you know, that's something that as uh, health professionals, we take advantage of as well. So, uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped so. So in summary, to, to finish up, and thank you everyone for your attention and participation, e-cigarette use may be declining, but vaping is still an issue that we must address. We can't take our foot off the pedal.
for the progress we've made. And it'll be interesting to see what happens as we come out of the pandemic. You know, were the decreases in vaping use due to the decreased socialization because people were home, people were not um, interacting as much. So, you know, time will tell. Um, we have to continue to advocate to protect our children at the public health level. So, you know, governmental um, enforcement of the regulations in advertising, um, prevent youth by educating parents and families early on. And that's hopefully what uh, we've accomplished tonight. And recognize and treat, um, you know, nicotine is an addictive substance and recognize it as such and know that there are treatment modalities out there for those who need it. Those are my references. And I want to thank you again uh, for your attention and thank you to the Massapequa Takes Action Coalition for the invitation to speak to you.